Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National CyberWatch Center webinar series. Today's webinar is being presented by the ISSA Global Women in Security Special Interest Group. The webinar is entitled 2030, Building a Diverse Cybersecurity Workforce. And to introduce today's webinar is ISSA Global Women in Cybersecurity Special Interest Group Leader, Rhonda Farrell. Good afternoon, Rhonda. Thank you, Lewis. Welcome to today's National CyberWatch Center. The ISSA Global Women in Security Special Interest Group webinar presentation entitled 23rd Building the Diverse Cybersecurity Workforce, moderated by Gadri Dyer, with panelists Priyanka Komala, Noel Kyle, and Mr. Chad Bowser. With over 11,000 members in over 130 chapters in over 90 ISA is committed to developing and connecting cybersecurity leaders globally. We thank our members for joining us today and encourage today's visitors to become a part of our growing community. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions via the chat. Welcome, ISA members, guests, strategic partners, and our esteemed speakers. We have an outstanding webinar session planned today. But before we begin, we want to take a few moments to share the mission, vision, and purpose of the Women in Security Special Interest Group. Additionally, we would like to share the five main goals of the Women in Security Special Interest Group with our audience. For those on the telephone only, we would be happy to share these with you. Just reach out to us at wishbig at issa.org. Visit the ISSA website at issa.org to learn more about our core purpose and core values of integrity, excellence, and respect. ISSA works to develop and connect cybersecurity globally. ISSA's strategic goals surrounding leadership, programs, and influence are also posted at issa.org. We welcome you to visit our website and learn more about our organization. Our first ISSA Spotlight chapter, Colorado Springs, is one of the large ISSA's largest with over hey, Lauren, 500. This is Chad. I'm sorry members. to jump in. Um, we're not seeing um, the slides. We're just seeing the wrong screen. And um, I knew that there were some slides here. Sorry to interrupt. Do it. Thank you, Chad. There you go. Great. Its members and leaders have won many ISSA awards, including 2017 Chapter of the Year. It hosts a phenomenal veteran board enumerated in the contest for your reference, led by Ms. Colleen Murphy, and has seated two ISSA International Board of Directors, Dr. Sean Murray, currently serving, and Dr. George Coelho, previously served. I have to say Colorado Springs has three regional events of note this week, supporting their upcoming huge seminar, the Cyber Focus Day Conference and the Denver Metro Rocky Mountain Information Security Conference. Our second I have to say spotlight chapter, Chicago, is also a geographic powerhouse, bringing value at events, conferences, and special events to members and the broader cybersecurity community within the surrounding Chicago Geographic Group. A very strong and capable board is led by Ms. Valerie Baldwin and the fantastic and hard charging team listed for your record. I have to say, Chicago partners extensively to bring highly visible and value added events to the membership and broader cyber community, ranging from the Chicago Technology Cooperative meetings to the informative and entertaining chapter meetings to special regional officers. There is sure to be an event near in four years. We are currently serving members in 101 chapters in 48 countries. Our goal for 2020 is to serve members in all 137 chapters as well as most countries around the world. Our SIG liaison global cities are listed on the slide. If you are interested in becoming a SIG liaison for your chapter, please reach out to us at SIG isa.org or with it at isa.org. Our 2020 initiatives include transitioning 1,000 plus SIG members to full ISSA membership. 
holding 75 plus big branded events globally and supporting our big youth programs and scholarship <coughs> funds of $100,000 annually. We would like to introduce our ISA Global Wishnig leader, myself, the co founder of the Wishnig, Ms. Christy Wadwick, one of our Wishnig chapter liaisons, and Ms. Cassandra Dockus, one of our partner liaison relations volunteers. For those who are new to SIG, you will find that history and this is an intellectual capital and to write off slide. If you have ideas for events or other value add activities, we encourage you to submit feedback during our post webinar survey or reach out to us at WISIG at ISA.org or at SIG at ISA.org. We'd like to recognize our phenomenal ISSA Global WISIG Denver leaders including Sarah Avery, Elizabeth Van Ackeren, Mary Dean, Debbie Blythe, Danielle Wilson, Jenna Wilson, Emily McCormick, and Nancy Phillips. Last but not least, recognition-wise, we would like to recognize our ISA International Listing Advisors who supported and grew the listing all along the way. That is Candy Alexander, <coughs> Andrea Hoy, Sandra <coughs> Lambert, Debbie Christopherson, Jean Pollock, and Ann Rogers. Please support our highly valued Global SIG partner. If your organization is interested in sponsoring or partner with the limited security SIG, please reach out to us at, at ISSA.org. Our esteemed panel moderator, Ms. Deidre Diamond, is the founder and CEO of the National Cybersecurity Staffing Company, Cybersecurity Network, CyberSS. She is also the founder of the non not-for-profit thought leadership platform, BrainBase.org. Prior to founding CyberSM and BrainBase. Ms. Diamond was the VP of Sales for the National Technical Staffing Company Motion Recruitment, the first VP of Sales at Rapid7, and the CEO of Percussion Software. Because Ms. Diamond herself was hired as an entry-level employee and trained to lead technology service organizations and cybersecurity software organizations, she believes that tech community needs to expand its awareness and what it means to be in tech and what it means to be in cyber. Ms. Diamond desires to achieve a new way of hiring and retaining women in security. Again, welcoming you to our panel presentation 2030, Building and Divided Diverse Cybersecurity Workforce. Please welcome Daisy Diamond. Thank you, Rhonda. Really appreciate that. That was a sweet intro. And thank you to ISSA Global Women. Uh, you're such an incredible organization. I know I speak for the panelists. We're all happy to be here. So very much so appreciate it. And uh, we'll move into the next slide and introduce our first panelist here. Uh, we have Priyanka. Priyanka, you're with us here. We all decided we'd let everybody read our bios and instead uh, give each uh, panelist a minute or so to, to share what else they'd like to share with us. So please share with us and welcome. It's so great to have you. Your career is very impressive. Thank you so much, Deidre. And I'm excited to be part of this initiative. And I should say, uh, it's a great, beautiful day in Washington, D.C., and I'm so excited to be part of the session, and I look forward to hearing from the panelists as well as from the audiences here. Fantastic. Well, at the age of five, doing what you were doing is quite impressive. <laughs> uh, so, great hey, I'm still fascinated about an aeroplane. I should definitely say that, Deidre. <laughs> I, right? I share that with you. I share that with you. And maybe you can share later with us what, who, who inspired you at the age of five. Or how about now? Who inspired you at the age of five? I, there's always somebody, right, that got us. Yeah. Uh, I come from a family of attorneys. My dad is an attorney. My granddad is also an attorney. So I think it's just natural for us to be on stage and just keep speaking. So it was... Uh, it's been fun for me and for the last quarter century and I just enjoy sharing my experiences from the aeroplane to my personal life, my career journey. And it's just a natural extension is what I would say, Deidre. 
Yeah, I love it. And, you know, we're going to talk later about how we're going to attract more folks. And it's, it's another human that, that, that sells a, a concept or a, a craft or a skill to somebody else to get involved. And, you know, clearly it's, it can be our parents when, and, and it can be other people uh, as well. So thank you and welcome. All right. Our next panelist, Noelle, Kyle, another uh, very... Uh, uh, what a skilled professional that's made an amazing career and uh, so happy to have you here. What can you add to your bio here for us today? Oh, well, oh, well, thanks so much for that introduction. And I just wanted to say hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to participate in the panel. I'm really happy to be here to talk with you about such an important topic and to tell you more about what we're doing to build up the National Cybersecurity Workforce at the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm here from an office called the Cybersecurity Education and Awareness Grant, or CENA, and we're also here in the Washington, D.C. area. So you can see my bio up on the screen. I'll just uh, give a little bit of an overview. So I lead national workforce development training and education programs, and I've been doing this work for DHS for about seven years in a few different roles. And previously, I have many more years of experience across other business, marketing, finance, and human capital work areas. I have an MBA from the University of Miami in Florida and a bachelor's degree in marketing from Old Dominion University in Virginia. And I also hold PMP and CISM certifications. And again, I'm just so happy to be here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Amazing awesome profile. So you're going to have uh, so much to add for us without, you know, uh, NICE and the, and the framework that was created, gosh, corporate America, which is where I spend the majority of my time. And I know Chad does too, uh, is, is, you know, didn't have any sort of framework until you folks created what you've created. And yet we're still going to hear, I bet throughout our conversation today that we don't have enough training and we don't have enough guidance. And so, so happy to have you to, to, to jump on that conversation with us. And um, thank you for coming. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Chad Loader, I mean, what a pleasure. It's been too many years since we've done work together until this program. Uh, Chad and I had the pleasure of building Rapid7 together for four years and, as, and Chad, one of the founders. Uh, so Chad, welcome and thanks for coming on a topic that uh, a lot of men <laughs> sometimes get scared from uh, joining because we will be getting into diversity and supporting the development of women. So uh, it's so great to have you. Absolutely. It's uh, super exciting to be here, Deidre. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm still on my journey here of learning about women's experiences and the experiences of people of color in the tech industry. So I'm going to be doing, as I've been doing, a lot of listening and learning myself. Um, just uh, excited to be the token guy on a panel for once. That's a refreshing change. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you're certainly not token. Uh, that's for darn sure. Uh, I've, uh, as I said, got the pleasure to work with you. So I got to see firsthand uh, what you did to go out of your way to make sure that both um, women and men uh, were working in a culture that they loved. And uh, no surprise that uh, you and I use the word love in the workforce all the time. So uh, we're so happy to have you. You really have proven that in your career and the companies that you've created. So welcome. And I am now going to drive from here, if uh, we all don't mind, which I'm sure we don't, and bring up a few slides here uh, to... Uh, guide us in our conversation and you know we're going to start with a conversation that sometimes people say why do we need to have this conversation about why do firms need cyber talent but the reality is we do have an audience here of uh, a lot of schools and young adults or or adults that want to maybe check out cyber and so let's let's give five minutes to this conversation everybody and really help our community or uh, people listening figure uh, out what, what's what's the real need for cyber talent today? Uh, and why don't we start off with uh, Chad? Why don't we start with you? What's your what's your take on this topic? I and mean, we've got a lot of great things here on the screen that our audience can read. What what really is this topic about for you? I think for me, um, the topic is about the fact that you know we're not going to have technology solve all of our problems here in, in cybersecurity. And um, if you you know, a recent study just came out um, actually this month, uh, which 
interviewed CISOs and said, you know, what are your top concerns? And uh, data breach was number two. Number one was staffing and retaining uh, talent. So I think that gives an indication that this is a huge problem and it's, it is a generational problem. It's not, it's not going to go away anytime soon. We need to continue working at it and the gap is getting larger. Yeah, I mean, how interesting those two statistics together. I mean, uh, I, when the Equifax breach happened, uh, I've, I, I remember having seen how many jobs they had posted as, you know, owning a staffing firm and watching that marketplace. And so when I heard about the breach, it was the first time I thought to myself, are you serious? This has to be because I've watched 20 something cyber hands on infosec roles be posted from Equifax for a year, never leaving, never getting filled, right? And so, you know, here we are, we have breaches as number one as the problem, and number two, staffing and retaining. And, and to me, it's the other way around, uh, you know, meaning we're not going to stop, uh, you know, sort of, uh, if, if somebody really wants to get something, then they know where it is. However, we can, we can really defend ourselves if we're properly staffed at a greater capacity, right? And so it, it ought to be number one, right? I mean, in terms of worrying about a breach, <laughs> uh, second. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Do you see that in the marketplace too? You know, un, un, departments not staffed to what they need to be? I think that, um, you know, it was the, the initial problem that we heard CISOs complaining about was we don't have enough funding. And now that, you know, companies are actually paying more attention and corporate boards are required to pay attention to the stuff, the funding is there. And the, the skill and talent gap is, is uh, still a huge problem. And um, it's also super competitive, right? So there's a ton of competition for, for security talent. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I can tell you that I still see massive budget problems for hiring security professionals. And I just published some research on companies not getting who they want over $10,000. And it's pretty mind blowing stuff. Uh, so we'll we talk more about this a little bit later because it's going deeper into, you know, well, how are we going to solve this problem is where we need to go next. I really appreciate your view on why we need cyber talent today. You're, you're saying, look, breaches are happening everywhere. It's the number one concern, <laughs> um, and, and breaches are costly. Um, Noelle, what do you think about this in terms of why firms need cyber talent and what's happening uh, right now? Yeah. Like yeah, so every day our world is becoming more and more connected, and, and we use technology in almost every aspect of our lives. So. We use our mobile devices for everything from connecting with our friends and family to shopping and banking. And the technology we use, it's opening us up and the organizations that we're working with, the online threats and even just a general human error. So the need for cybersecurity and the need for workers in cybersecurity exists anywhere and everywhere there's a computer. So as a matter of fact, here at DHS, our overall vision is to secure the nation from threats. And as part of that, one of our key missions is to secure and safeguard cyberspace. We have the lead for the federal government for securing the civilian government computer systems. And so we work with industry and state, local, tribal and territorial governments to secure critical infrastructure and information systems. And we know that the threats against these government information, these government networks are becoming more sophisticated, frequent and dynamic every day. So in response, we do things like risk assessment, mitigation, and incident response. And we're looking for, preparing for, preventing and responding to catastrophic cyber incidents that could overwhelm our infrastructure. So I wanted to add in a couple of statistics. We run something called the NCIC, or the National Cybersecurity Communications and Integration Center. It's a 24-7 situational awareness, incident response, and management center, and it leads response efforts through a lot of these different technical assistance programs. So 24-7, they're collecting data, they're analyzing cyber threats, and they're protecting and responding to incidents. In 2016 alone, they received more than 110,000 reports, and they released more than 26,000 actionable cybersecurity alerts, bulletins, and other pieces of information. So the reason why I mentioned these statistics and I'm talking a little bit more about what we do at DHS is just to explain why we're so committed to building up this workforce and what we see as the need for the cybersecurity talent and not just the need for DHS internally or even for the federal government. So there's a huge demand for the entire nation and all of the private organizations and state and local governments 
that we work with too. And so in our office, we've realized that not only do we have to have the technical infrastructure in place to protect against these threats, but we also have to have the people too. And we've got to have the right people with the right skills, abilities, and knowledge to be able to run those systems and protect against attacks. So we know we've got to build up this highly skilled cyber workforce for the nation and get this cyber talent in place to protect all of us and respond to cyber threats. Absolutely, wow, well said. Uh, and, and love this 24 by seven statistic share. That is awesome, mm -hmm. awesome to hear. And uh, it is also what corporate America is doing is 24 by seven security operation centers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are, yep. you, are you starting to see collaboration between the two from that perspective of collecting data? Absolutely. That's a, yeah, great question. That's a really important piece of this is the information sharing. So there are lots of different information sharing centers in place and partnerships with the federal government and other sectors too to share this information back and forth and really with the goal of making all of us more secure and protecting all of our networks. I love it. I love it. I say this all the time out speaking. This is a matter of national security. Our talent gap is a matter of national security. Our lack of diversity in this field is a national security issue. And uh, I thank mm -hmm. you for your service. Uh, very much so. Uh, and, and your work on this. It's uh, you, you folks have been working hard and uh, are really ahead of the game. I love it. Priyanka, what's your thoughts on this um, topic here? Yes, Deidre, yes. The panelists have discussed so far, security is truly everyone's problem, right? So when we had this Equifax breach, it was your personal professional information that's always at risk. And I think that was a great eye opener to people from different walks of life to understand that security is not just the problem of a CISO of a particular company. So it's a, I was looking at a recent report from IDC, which pegs uh, the security industry growing at a rate of about $100 billion uh, by 2020. So there's great opportunity, uh, both from a cyber uh, you know, defense standpoint and ways how cyber attacks are going to continue to evolve from trends like AI, artificial intelligence. So it's an exciting time, I would say, and it's also a great time for organizations to take a look back on how do we start and how do we start to attract talent from diverse industries, not just cybersecurity, but get more perspectives in terms of filling the talent pipeline. I love that angle and thank you for bringing that up because it's really important as people are out there socializing these careers and bringing these careers to the forefront to understand that there's a lot of money here. <laughs> you know, like um, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with talking about that. As you said, a uh, hundred billion investment. I, I think the last statistic I saw was there's 1100 cybersecurity startups happening a month. Like, no joke. Uh, you know, those, we've all been around a long time. I remember in 2007 that nobody knew what vulnerability management was, you know, and I had to go uh, sell, sell what it was, you know. So I think that's just a great point for not only are there exciting careers around AI and just everything we're doing being so exciting, there's also money here. And a lot of money coming to this and uh, people want to be able to provide for themselves and I'll tell you and I'll to, switch to this next slide right now I can tell you that I see and one of the reasons why I founded brainbabe.org was to um, solve the problem that tons of uh, college graduates are graduating in in degrees in you know philosophy or journalism or sociology or you know it, the arts let's say a little bit more of the social sciences and they're not even thinking about careers in cyber and the job Jobs that they're getting or tech the jobs that they're getting are, are numbing their minds they're not happy they're depressed there's no real future they're customer service jobs I mean we're we've got Starbucks bragging about how college students are paying back their loans by coming to work for Starbucks as baristas I mean I'm a hundred thousand of them you know and so um, I, I think those hundred thousand could be with us <laughs> uh, and I think that those jobs can be repurposed to more high school or retirement type things and then so anyhow brainbabe.org staffs all of our conferences, uh, our work uh, conferences with STEAM students so that we can start to expose them to our industry. So uh, anyhow, I really appreciate you bringing that up because the, the, the financial stability that one can create in this industry must be something we sell. 
Uh, all right, so I've got this new slide up here. This is the most recent projected. I was wondering how long it would take us to put the, the, the number two in front of uh, how many were short, and it didn't take us long. Uh, so this is the most recent. And it might be a little bit to see, difficult to see here uh, some of these job categories. So I have, a, I have another slide. Um, but before I do, uh, you folks, you three are out in the workforce every day. How, where do you see the skills gap show up? Where, where, where are you seeing this problem? How are you seeing this problem show up? I mean, we know the overall idea is more breaches and what have you, but where do you see it on a daily basis? And, uh, you know, um, why don't we start with you, Noel? How do you see this affect daily life uh, in your world? Yeah, sure. So it's so interesting to see the 2 million number on the screen. You know, just like you said, there are so many different statistics counting up the number of cybersecurity professionals that will be needed in the future. Another one we see and we use a lot is that 1.8 million by the year 2022. And there are a lot of tools and resources out there that will show you where that demand is. So I see one of the, th the big things we see is just the need to hire and the need that organizations have to fill some of these critical positions. You know, it was interesting because last night I, we were doing a little bit of research about the field and about how, uh, given the, the women focus of the webinar today, how we fit into the, this national cybersecurity workforce. And we saw that, you know, 11% of the global information security workforce is made up by women. And in North America, there's slightly more, about 14%. And, and you know, it's really interesting to see that women are entering the field a little bit less than men, even when you see some studies show that the background of females might have very similar education or even even more degrees than some of some other similar applicants. So we think it's really important to bring up that diverse perspective that females and all minority groups can bring to add into the cybersecurity workforce to help build up and fill that two million number you see on the screen. And uh, you know, all of those diverse perspectives will help us think of new ways to attack cybersecurity threats. And, you know, I just, one of the things we're doing is we're thinking about how we'll fill this number as we run many different types of cybersecurity education, workforce development and training programs, all geared at building up the national pipeline of cybersecurity workers to include building up that pipeline with female candidates. And I know we'll have opportunities to tie in more resources, but I will be talking about a lot of other resources as we go through the slides. And I noticed earlier in the chat box, there was a question about K through 12 curriculum. So we offer a free, we offer free curriculum for teachers. They can download off our website. I think I'll get to that in another slide, but if there, I don't have a chance, I wanted to mention our website, NICS, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies. The website is nix.us-gov, and maybe we can send it out when we send out the slides. For sure. Yes, we will touch it. And then at the end, one more time, would love for you to put that out there. Yeah, uh, I can't see the chat, folks. So you all, at any time, uh, you know, bring up a question and answer it. I love that. Uh, yeah, I would imagine that you're feeling also in the gov a little bit of losing um, people to, to corporate America. Is that true? Is that still happening? I don't service the gov myself, but I can tell you that there's a premium on government candidates, <laughs> you know, meaning <laughs> corporate America wants your folks, right? You folks have been in the game a lot longer than corporate America. You invented the internet. Uh, so um, what, how is that affecting? Are you feeling that? Because it's, it, it, yeah. It. Well, I think that the field is just so, com it's so competitive right now to find more people to fill the jobs. And so, because it is very competitive, you see organizations offering more resources or higher level, higher salaries to folks to try to recruit them. So another thing we keep in mind is what can our recruiting strategies look like? What levers do we have to bring people in? Maybe it's pay, maybe it's really cool missions. We like to focus on the fact that you have such so many cool things to do working for the government. You're helping protect our country. And we're also looking at recruitment strategies, or excuse me, retention strategies. So what can we do to keep people once they've been hired? And we're looking at things like building career pathways to give people opportunities for advancement or to show them how they can advance. And then we offer several training programs too to give them more skills and expertise as they move throughout their career. 
Yeah. I was going to say that's the number one thing lacking in corporate America. And as much as it really just hurts my soul as a citizen that we're having this struggle, meaning, you know, as an individual, it's very difficult to pass up the kind of money that corporate America will give. Uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, you, you know, the, you have such cool projects and I can tell you that what corporate America is lacking is the training, which you all do so well. So keep, keep focusing on that. And Hey, if there's a place mm -hmm. where we can all sign up that says everybody can make the same kind of money as corporate America, <laughs> I'll sign that ballot because we need to not be losing because of that. Um, that being said, it's, it is robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? We are one team corporate and gov and uh and it doesn't help any uh anybody so i appreciate that um that dialogue there um how about you chad any any um real signs that you see every day that concern you a, a couple um i would say people don't work for companies they work for people right and so one of the issues that i've seen in my consulting business and, and in advising clients on how to approach security in their companies is that the, the CISOs uh, that are out there tend to come from technical backgrounds and um, they don't necessarily have as much experience in leadership and management and development of staff. So um, security is a grind. It's a difficult job. It's a time consuming job. And um, security often, uh, you know, they're the people that you don't, talk about them, you don't hear anything about them uh, unless something is going wrong, right? And so it can also be a very thankless job. And so, well, I think it's definitely important to focus on the wide end of the funnel and, and getting people into the industry. Um, it's also important to focus on what's gonna keep people in, in the industry because I see people wash out, not because they're not skilled enough, but because it's a thankless job um, and the money's great, but maybe they're working for, um, uh, a security department within a company that really doesn't get the recognition that they deserve or they don't have the power to, to, to do their jobs. They're only going to get blamed if something goes wrong, but you know, they're, they're not able to really have the impact they want to have. And a lot of that has to do, frankly, with the quality of the security executives and the amount of training and focus that we put on for people who are in the path to become a chief security officer. Um, how are we emphasizing the skills that they're going to need? The, the tech skills is what got them to be on the path, but the management skills, the leadership skills, the communication and influence skills, um, where are those getting developed along that? Because that's, that's who people end up working for. And that's uh, going to be a key difference in how we retain people uh, in this industry. Yeah, it's really, I mean, I see it every day being in the staffing business. Uh, the number one reason for leaving is uh, that the organization doesn't take security seriously enough. And that shows up in everything from being understaffed to uh, not being, um, you know, heard or, or, or not being nurtured or having training programs. It really, it is a problem. We're seeing, uh, you know, chief cyber executives leaving jobs every 18 months. And I think we all know that it takes a year just to even figure out the new gig of how the company works never mind you know never mind make a difference uh and and as you said you know being a cyber professional you're you're, you're losing the majority of the time just based on the nature of the business if you will you know uh so um, I want to see so much more focus on this. So what that really means is if we're short to, you know, 2 million and we're having this major retention challenge, well, how can we win the, the fight, which is a national security fight, right? Abs absolutely. Right? It's and I think scary. one of the other things too, if, if we, if we, you know, we talk about, okay, how do we get more people into the field? How do we get more people into the, into the university programs? But there's also, I think, a ton of opportunity that gets overlooked for people to transfer into the security organization laterally or diagonally from other orgs. So I work in the security awareness field um, and the company that I, you know, that I found at Habituate is you know, in security awareness, which as a niche of cybersecurity is really interesting because 60% of the full-time security awareness practitioners in, uh, in corporate America uh, are women. 
right, which is pretty unusual. And many of them actually have come over from corporate development, learning, uh, corp, corp comms, and other backgrounds and done amazing work within security awareness. So uh, it doesn't always have to be this path up through an EE program or a CS program in university. There's a ton of opportunity, I think, to transfer laterally, and we need to encourage that more. Totally. I love that you said that. And I didn't know that statistic of 60% are women. That makes sense. Uh, and also um, just the fact that folks from sales and marketing uh, that go into uh, different types of cyber roles. We'll talk about that in a minute. Love it. Priyanka, I'm going to move to the next slide because I'm going to combine the two here um, and, and uh, take it a little bit further here because we're talking about these 2 million jobs and we're talking about we've got the openings plus the retention issues and this sort of further you know categorizes the jobs and so for instance these are job categories so if we clicked on let's say which we can't do right now but security engineer you would see cloud security right and so there's different uh you know in different types of security engineers but when you look at this and you think about the talent shortage and the retention what's what 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 are your uh, thoughts on or what are you seeing every day is is most important to this yeah, Deidre, let me give you an example of how IBM is addressing the talent shortage in cybersecurity to begin with. They're creating something called the new collar jobs. So basically, as what Chad mentioned earlier on, you don't really need to have a traditional path of having a, a four-year degree in computer science in order to get into cybersecurity. So as long as you have certain key characteristics that comprise of a cybersecurity professional, say your curiosity, because you're the challenges that you're going to deal with on a daily basis are going to be so different. Your passion for problem solving and then having strong ethical skills on how do you handle a situation and understanding and mitigating risks. So those are some of the key characteristics that I see have evolved in this technological landscape. And as long as you have those key skills along with your technical acumen and then your soft skills, right? Your communication skills, your uh, your leadership skills and the way you can navigate around with teams, I think Collaboration is, is, is critical at different stages of management when you're handling such situations. So I would say those are the key characteristics that really comprise uh, a successful professional in any of these roles, be it non-technical, technical, or your leadership roles. I love it. I love it. You panelists are, we're giving a 360 degree view here and we didn't practice. <laughs> um, it's so exciting that you, you, you brought this piece to this topic. So, and it fits right here with this slide and the EQ, the soft skills, right? And it certainly speaks to the retention issue we're having. Uh, couldn't agree more. This focus on our soft skills, we must understand that whether you fall in the non-technical roles, the technical roles, the leadership roles, it's imperative. We work in teams. We must communicate well, which is what soft skills are. You know, I, I um, read a study a few weeks ago that Google put out what they did with Harvard, and they looked at all their top performers throughout Google. Uh, and they, their hypothesis was that the top performers, you know, had scored really high on IQ and um, average on EQ. And um, what it came back was the opposite. They, sky, they scored really high on EQ and lower on IQ compared to the rest of the folks in the organization that weren't high performers. And so I think, you know, we've all sort of figured it out through our career. Now we're getting statistics and, and we've, you know, uh, there's proof that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how technical one is, one must also be just as good with communication to really have a career that's fulfilling and to bring others in and to grow our departments and uh, our, you know, uh, team members. So I love that you brought that up and that you folks are focusing on that at IBM. Thank you, Deidre. And uh, just to say, I was an intern uh, for IBM during my college days, so uh, it's always exciting to see how this organization is evolving as a key leader. But I also wanted to add that, imagine every day when you go to work, you want to work for someone who's a very poised leader who feels that the situation would always be under control. So I think that's a fabric that runs across any kind of role that you play in the cybersecurity space. You know, somebody who, who acts as a leader irrespective of the, the level of role that you're in. I love it. Totally. Totally. I mean, the retention stats and people aren't leaving because of money and technology. They're being, they're being, they're leaving because of how they're treated. So, uh, you know, let's, let's be smarter about that. 
Um, I love it, love it, love it. So for some reason, I can't get my next slide here. I think it's time to take us into deeper in the conversation here. Sorry about that, I just stopped sharing. I'm gonna share again just to make sure that I don't have any problems here, but let's get deeper in this and let's talk about women specifically and women coming into cyber and I, you know uh, to me we're not selling these careers well in K through 12 so Noel I would love to hear what you're doing meaning uh, you know so as a community as a society television media we see cyber people as males um, 95 percent of the time and um, we see them as a keyboard and a hoodie and so when people say to me, why aren't there more women? I'm like, it's really obvious, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not selling these careers well. Uh, and then when we look further, you know, uh, deeper, we even see and still hear te you know, stories of teachers saying, you know, young women don't need to be in cyber or tech or what have you. So anyhow, I would love to hear what you're doing to change this, Noelle. Uh, yeah, great. So we're, we're doing a lot of different things in education to try to engage students at a really early age in STEM and STEAM education. So adding that arts piece in there too. So we want to hook students early on and we want to hook women and get them really excited about the field too. And what we hear and what we're studying, just like what you just said, one of the best ways we can do this is by giving them teachers, mentors, parents, and other role models who can encourage them to study cybersecurity. So according to the Girl Scouts Research Institute, girls will either self-eject or self-select, so choose to come in or choose to go out of STEM by fifth grade. So that's pretty early on. You can still get them interested after that, but it might be slightly harder. So that's why we're offering those. One of the things we're doing in the K-12 space is we do offer free curriculum. It's developed by our partner uh, called NYSERC. And we have 11 courses which can be used on their own or on a modular basis. So teachers can either use the courses exactly as is or they can pull out pieces and use them within, the, within their classes. We have more than 2,000 content hours to choose from. So if you're a teacher, if you know someone who is, I already saw some questions in the chat box about resources for teachers. You can learn more about that on the NYX website. And earlier I chatted the website in the chat and we can get that out to everybody too. So that's one thing we're doing, but we're also working on the college and university level. So we have more than 200 colleges and universities across the country that are designated as Centers of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense, or CAEs. This is a program that's jointly sponsored by NSA and DHS. So students can go to one of these schools, they can enter the program, they know that it has met very rigorous criteria and it's been reviewed by both NSA and DHS. And those schools, at some of those schools, there's even scholarship opportunities. There's something called a scholarship for service, which offers a full tuition and a stipend for students studying in the field. Then when they graduate, they do have to provide service through government employment, but that government employment can be at any level, federal, local, state. And the program even helps connect students with government employers through several different job fairs. And so you can learn more about all of that on NICS also. So for any, then for any working professionals or for those who are exploring new careers in cyber and they just need that training to get them into the field, we also offer something called a Federal Virtual Training Environment or FedBTE. This is completely free cybersecurity training for government employees. So again, any level of government, federal, state, local, or tribal, or veterans at FedBTE, we've got more than 60 courses at varying proficiency levels. So people can go into the site and they can take more introductory or entry level courses. We just last year added 101 level courses. So 101 in coding, reverse engineering, and critical infrastructure. And they can even take much more advanced courses too if they're just trying, if they want to specialize in their field or pick up new skills. But we also wanted to mention uh, Raytheon and National Cybersecurity Alliance report that identified a talent gap, it identified exactly what we've been saying here in the presentation today, that far few, fewer women are entering cybersecurity. And they found that more young men in the survey said that they were likely to consider, and consider going into the field than women, but it suggested that a lot of this had to do with communication. 
They said that the more that the women reported that teachers or counselors had discussed careers with them and told them what type of careers were available, the more likely that set of women would en would enter into the field. So it seems like there's a large piece of communication that's needed here to encourage, well, first to familiarize people with the field, let them know what types of job opportunities are available. And then also there's a mentorship piece and a role model piece that's needed to engage people also. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Fifth grade, yeah, I mean, our brain, mm -hmm. our brains at seven have developed their emotional sort of grounding. So it makes sense to me that if we're not in there making it a positive experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then it's, it's most likely not going to happen. You know, when I look at the left side of this, you know, chart here, Noel, it's like, okay, here's all the people, including myself that stumbled into cyber, which sort of makes sense in that it's mm -hmm. you know, not as old as it, of an industry as let's say IT or software, but it's still happening today. Is there a folk, meaning, you know, folks that just stumble upon cyber? Is there a program? Oh. For, yeah, go ahead. If that triggered something. Oh, well, I think you're about to ask a different question, but it definitely made me think, yeah, there's a huge need for people with all different types of backgrounds and the jobs there, you know, within the cybersecurity field, there are many jobs that are, there's jobs that are traditional IT, but there's, uh, or more network defense, but there are also a lot of other support roles. There are jobs in law or acquisition or teaching, building curriculum, uh, their managerial roles. So just about anything you'd like to do or anything that somebody has interest in, there's probably a way to apply that to a cybersecurity job. There totally is. And that's what I was going to say. Is there something in the junior high and certainly the, the high school that really speaks to, you know, for instance, the slide that I just had up there, you know, prior, which was, you know, there's jobs in sales, there's jobs in marketing, there's jobs in awareness training and training and be, a, you know, found, you know, start a company. <laughs> you can be in leadership. You know, I have a cybersecurity team that reports to me and I'm, no, I'm not technical from the traditional knowing how to code or, or network engineering background. And so, you know, is there a place to, that that content's being spread early? It, it, that's my question. And if not, yeah, I can add to any content you have and help you get yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, there are a lot of different resources and tools for that type of thing. A couple of things that come to my mind, I want to mention quickly, the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, it came up earlier in the conversation. So the framework is a resource that's been developed in partnership with many different organizations, including DHS. As a matter of fact, one of my colleagues helped write, he's a co-author of the NIST special publication 800-181, which published the latest version of the Workforce Framework. So the Workforce Framework is what we use to describe cybersecurity work and categorize it. So if, if students are curious about what they would be interested in doing within the field, they could use that resource to learn about the different types of work. And then the other thing I would, well, two more things I'd like to say. One is that the curriculum helps with that because if students are, if cybersecurity concepts and STEM concepts are infused with what, into what they're learning, they can pick out what they like and maybe try to focus on that or keep studying those topics as they move throughout their, uh, their, career, their schooling and then their career. And then the third thing I want to say is another way for students to get hands-on experience and learn about what interests them the most is by participating in camps, clubs, competitions, things like that, things where they can get hands-on experience in real time, work with a mentor, and work with all of their friends, too, on challenges. Love it. Love it. Such great stuff to share. So we know that we've got the, you know, the, the reason why we don't have more uh, women coming in, and I would argue men, too, is that we don't sell this correctly. And so this program, you know, that may have been designed to attract more women will most likely attract more men, too, uh, I would imagine, because the stereotype that we've created is, was so narrow. Uh, and so that's awesome. And so I've always, I've said over the last few years, we're going to solve the talent gap, I, I would imagine, faster than the retention or how about just the happiness levels and um, in terms of our cyber professionals and being able to work together. And so let's take it to, to a little bit deeper on the side of uh, bringing women into cyber and get our last, you know, what, five minutes together to hear from each of you your 
you know, words of wisdom in um, retaining women. Uh, you know, I often find that I need to make folks aware that, you know, when you have a minority of any, for, uh, for whether it be uh, religion, race, or, or gender, uh, by definition of minority, the person is, you know, sort of the one person in the room, or maybe two out of, you know, a, a, a 20. And therefore, it's, it, it does require more attention to help make sure that those folks and that the team, you know, are acclimated. And so anyhow, at least, you know, it doesn't mean that they're treated, you know, more special. That's silly. It means that their needs are attended to. Uh, you know, that's all it means. And so does everybody else's needs need to be attended to. It's just more of the perspective of be aware that these folks don't feel and think and perceive like you do possibly if you fall into the non-minority care, you know, category and have a plan to help, have a, have a plan to make sure it works out. Because I'll tell you what, the stats, as we mentioned earlier, it's not working out. And women are still struggling. And goodness knows, we know the whole, you know, uh, sort of world has become more visual to us of how bad it actually is recently. Uh, so what's our words of wisdom to the audience to say, you know, once women are with us, you know, what's, how, do we, how do we make sure they're successful and, and, and that they get past middle management? You know, and what's the call to me? It's a call to men, you know, certainly and women, but if men are 90% of the business, then it's men that are going to solve this. So chat, let's, let's start with you, uh, Reverend, yeah. you know, what do you, what, what do you got for us on this topic? What are your thoughts? Well, I think for me, it's, it's, um, w what I'm learning is the importance of listening. So, you know, as I started to read all these, you know, me too stories that were coming out, my initial response was, God, what a bunch of total creeps, you know, and I, I never engage in that sort of stuff. And if I ever saw that at one of my companies, I'd put a stop to it right away. And so therefore, you know, my thinking was, well, I'm one of the good guys, right? And so I'm one of the good guys because I don't do that sort of stuff. And reality is for a man, um, being one of the good guys requires more than just not being one of the bad guys. And it requires more than just whatever DNI program your HR department has. It, it requires some actually active listening, you know, and so listen 90% of the time, listen to what women are going through and stop saying not all men are like that. I'm not like that. I don't know anyone like that, but just really listen because you'll learn and I'm, I continue to learn. And if there's things that make you uncomfortable, like uh, my co-founder and I, you know, we're both white men um, and we're aware of that. And we recently were at, you know, at, a, at an event and we said, you know, our next hire is going to be a, um, an executive uh, and, it's, and we're going to make sure that it's a woman. And uh, so many men were uncomfortable with that. Suddenly there's this huge interest. You know, when we say something like that, there's a huge interest in merit-based, you know, hiring. And well, it shouldn't just be a woman. It should be the best person for the job. And, um, and you know, we've sort of sat through that, sat through that discomfort and kind of figured out how we want to do things and, and why we want to make it, you know, a, a targeted hiring decision, um, if at all possible. And I think that um, that comes from listening and comes from realizing, wow, my network is really anemic, right? So if I'm just hiring out of my network and I'm using that, met, that merit based approach, um, I'm not reaching a lot of the great women that are in the field. So it's not just that there aren't enough women in the field, it's that they're not well connected enough, right? Um, and that the chances are, if, if you're like me, that your network underrepresents the women that are in the field. And there's lots of reasons why that's the case. Networking opportunities are more difficult, more challenging for many women, especially working mothers. They can't always go to a week-long conference as easily as working fathers can, right? And that's just the way that our society assigns those responsibilities. Unfortunately, it's not fair. Um, so, you know, um, there, there's just a ton of things that I think I'm learning, you know, about um, how to amplify women's voices in the workplace, how to, you know, be careful with language, um, and how to make sure that we're actively building our networks um, to include the great women that are out there. Ask, you know, ask publicly on LinkedIn, Twitter, hey, who are the amazing women in my field who specialize in this or that? Who should I follow? Who should I connect with? Um, and then if you're going to participate in conferences, um, make sure that you say, hey, we have a policy. We're not going to participate in panels or events where women or people of color are underrepresented, um, which might mean you need to pass up certain opportunities, which is great. Encourage the conferences you do go to to provide childcare. 
um, for attendees and participants. They're going to get a lot more women applicants uh, if they do that. The Grace Hopper Conference last year did a great job at that. And then listen to what women's experiences are at networking events, at conferences. Listen to them. Uh, listen to, like I just learned, for example, fairly recently that there is a talk that women give to other women when they're going to attend something like DEF CON for the first time, a security conference, which is, you know, a whole talk on how to not get into creepy situations, how to deal with sort of uncomfortable things that are going to happen at the conference. Um, and so listening helps, helps me and I continue to listen, continue to learn. I love it. I love it. I, you've touched on so many things. I'm going to, I'm going to cover a few of them real quickly with you. One is, you know, think, Thank you for, as a, as a man, putting yourself in that uncomfortable situation. I mean, I bet you it was more uncomfortable than you're even saying, which is why I'm laughing, meaning it is truly interesting how uh, people can get caught up in, and both sides, and I don't mean sides like against each other, but both men and women in this topic of hiring um, because somebody's a woman. And, um, and, you know, women also struggle with that because they certainly don't necessarily want to be hired because they're a woman. And yet, you know, what I've got my head around is, look, what you're doing is you're hiring for diversity because diversity is who we're up against, you know, meaning, you know, our adversaries, uh, the, the, the folks that we're seeking to protect ourselves from are, are diverse. And, and so if we're not diverse in defending, defending ourselves, then we're not going to win. And so it's, only, it's, a, it's not just because you care about equal rights for women. It's, 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 it's also about it's smart business, smart defense, if you will. And so I'd like people to see that. And, uh, and, and also, I know it's uncomfortable. And at the same time, you know, our conferences, look, our conferences are a massive problem. It's why I've done, you know, we're staffing these events with students who want to in, be interested in, 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 you know, cyber versus uh, models that we dress up. Uh, and so I'm glad you brought that up. And we got to, we just got to clean it up. If we were going to clean up, that's, that's like the easiest thing to clean up as far as I'm concerned. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Women really struggle it, not just from the environment of you know, sexualization in the, in, in the uh, booths, but also from the perspective of, like you said, not being able to attend and uh, as long or as much uh, based on childcare. And so call to arms to all men and women to make sure that childcare exists and make sure that nobody hires booth babes anymore and, and, and makes those jobs, jobs for all genders and also uh, do a lot more listening uh, and taking action on that listening. I really appreciate it, Chad. That's great advice. And yeah, we're not going to, there are only so many women you can recruit from and there's certainly not as accessible. So you definitely need to get out there and network. Um, awesome. So Priyanka, what are you, what are your thoughts on this topic here? Hey, Deidre. First, I want to say, Thank you, Chad, for your candid insights. And I'm quite sure the audience were enthralled with your response as well. So touching base on that, it's crucial for men to be mentors and allies and champions for women. So uh, that's something that we have to continue to do in order to retain more women talent as well and ensuring they get the right recognition. Because at the end of the day, apart from the impact that you have being, a, uh, being in the cyberspace, being recognized for the behind the scenes work, uh, that's indispensable. So that's one key uh, uh, nugget that I wanted to share. Two more. Uh, the second one is we spoke about lateral hires, people from different walks of lives entering into the cybersecurity field. So and again, speaking from my own personal experiences, when you're looking at transferring your skills, which might uh, align with another domain, but you might not really have the expertise, which you can learn on, on the go through technical training. I think giving ongoing educational opportunities for your staff or people who are interested in getting into the cyberspace, but might be working in a different division of yours, being open to those ideas. I think that's key to inspire more diverse talent into the cybersecurity space. And three, it's about um, two aspects. One, it's how do you market these jobs? There was a question on the chat poll about you know, we have a lot of interested people, it's, but how do you find the right kind of jobs for them? So it's upon us as employers, leaders in organizations to market these kinds of jobs to the right kind of people in ways that they understand and bringing these stereotypes as to this is how, a, you know, a geek or a nerd has to look like. 
So that's one aspect. And then the second aspect, which we as women can do for each other is to see more women achieving and having them speak more via different channels, be it social media or conferences or writing blog posts about their experiences and how a day is in the life of a cybersecurity professional. I think those key aspects would inspire more young girls and boys to be part of the security space going forward. So ongoing education, marketing, and mentoring, and above all, having men as allies and champions would be crucial for the future of the cybersecurity diverse workforce. Totally agree. Love the way you put that. I'll say it again, you know, men are going to make the difference here. The change will come from that only because of math, meaning there's 90% of them. I'm going to say it again. So I really appreciate you calling that out. And also the, the ability to absorb the entry level candidates that are coming out of school. I see a serious problem with organizations not being able to absorb them. Uh, so, and you touched on that with these training programs at the entry level, taking them from other departments, taking them with no experience, get, get on top of a training program. Awesome. Well said. Thank you. Noelle, wrap it up here for us uh, before we pass. <laughs> to I, uh, I, sure, so. yeah. I just want to say thank you both to my co-panelists for their wonderful comments. I just want to echo exactly what they've said and say, oh, overall, the most important thing is for men to be supportive, to be allies and to champion women and to discourage and prevent discrimination against women in the workforce. So, you know, studies show that women who feel appreciated in the, work, in the workforce benefit greatly from mentoring professional development opportunities and that male mentors and champions should do anything they can to encourage professional development and, and growth for their female colleagues. So again, just be supportive and help them find opportunities along the way. Yeah. And I'd just like to wrap to say, uh, I, I would like to see this done for men as well. Meaning, uh, you know, we, if we're going to keep the women we have, you better do it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the men need this type of attention too. I, I give this talk called, we all want the seven same things at work. And, and that is to, uh, you know, one of them is to be trained and have a path and, and uh, a career vision. So uh, that being said, if, if, if not done for the minorities, uh, we'll lose them because it's uncomfortable already uh, in, many, in many places. So thank you all. What a great conversation. We touched upon uh, you know, the, the, the talent gap as well as the retention and, and really focused on diversity and certainly supporting women. And what a wonderful talk. And thank you all for the information. And these slides will go out. But at this point, I'm going to hand back the mic to ISSA Global Women. And we will make sure that this gets posted. And the comments and questions that were asked that were not answered, we will do uh, in writing and follow up. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Deidre. You're actually going to pass it back to National Cyber Watch. And thank you to all the panelists for your time. We do have some questions uh, that we've been collecting during the, um, during the uh, presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put these up here. And I may add to them because I see there's some more coming in. So let me share that screen. Uh, boom. There we go. Boom. So we'll start out, uh, go from top to bottom. So Deidre, I'm going to just present these questions to you, read them out to you. Uh, for the uh, uh, for those of folks that are just joining joining us from the phone, and uh, I'll let you address them or one of the panelists, however you want to do it. So the first question is: What tech companies are providing funding and mentors for K twelve teachers to prepare diverse students in cybersecurity? I am in Austin, Texas, and can't get the support from cyber companies that would be expected. Interesting. Uh, I don't know the answer to that to myself. Do you know that, Noelle, or maybe even Priyanka? I mean, IBM probably does something there. Which one? Noelle, do you want to take it? Uh, sure. For us, I mean, the, the, the funding and mentors, again, that goes back to our K-12 curriculum and the resources you can read about. Uh, you can read about on our next website. I really would recommend that everybody or, or those that are interested would take a look and download them as well as so as well as the curriculum we also offer professional development opportunities for teachers so that's something else those are those are 
uh, camps and other opportunities that teachers can have to learn the skills that they'll need to prepare the students. As a matter of fact, we're having two uh, three-day conferences this summer. It's called the Economic, or excuse me, the Education Discovery Forums, EDFs. One will be in June in Augusta, Georgia, June 4th through 7th, and the other will be, I believe, in Omaha in July from 10th to 12th. So we offer conferences like that that folks can attend and learn more about how to prepare their students and learn how to teach some of these hands-on activities. And there are also other opportunities where our, our subject matter experts will come out to schools and will teach teachers there on location too. So there's a lot of great opportunities um, there. So for the, for the individual in Austin, Texas, that might be something of interest for you. And again, you could learn more about that on next. And this is Chad, by the way. I think um, one of the things that I've discovered working within security awareness, so my company, Habituate, um, we give away our security awareness training materials and videos to any public K-12 uh, school district that asks for them. Um, and uh, we've done a little bit of work with this uh, fellow named uh, Josh Oaks, who um, if you go to smartsocial.com, he has a book called Light, Bright, and Polite. And one of the key things here, I think, to take away is that uh, K-12 Students now, they live in a digital world, and they're much more savvy with social media than we are. And so any, any uh, I think, attempts to sort of teach them about cybersecurity starts with their own security and privacy and the apps and, and things like that that they use. So make it personal for them, and, and you'll get their interest for sure. Awesome. Okay. Next question is, what was that brainbabe.org? <laughs> I love you. You sound like a talk show host. That was awesome. So brainbabe.org is a not-for-profit that I started a few years ago. We provide a service called STEAM Conference Connection, STEAM for STEM with the Arts, and we provide students who are interested in um, checking out the cybersecurity field to work those jobs. Those are paid jobs that typically uh, vendors, software companies are the vendors are calling modeling agencies or what's also called a marketing agency and, and, and not really caring to give any training or what is cyber or any of that. So we spend uh, time with these students and then giving them some backdrop on cyber and then we staff your booths, your conferences, your events, whatever you've got. So thank you for asking. The third question, how are organizations innovating in their recruiting and hiring practices, especially from higher education space? You know, I mean, I've seen uh, organizations have internship programs and recruiting from higher ed for a very, very long time. And I think this also will answer a question that I see here on the bottom of how do we get these people hired? The problem isn't so much that, you know, folks don't have recruiting practices for uh for talent, they do have recruiting practices. The problem is that cyber uh, educated entry level folks are not skilled enough to actually get hired. Uh, are certainly not hired in any quick capacity. Meaning, unlike IT and software, uh, the, you know, the hands-on learning within school works. And our hands-on learning today is not true cyber data or security operations center software or tools. And so when they come out, they're just too green for companies to absorb. I was talking to the Dean at Northeastern about this the other day. We must get a uh, real simulated security operations center, uh, you know, data in front of our students and have them really get exposed to what's a SIM, you know, uh, what are alerts and what am I looking for? And, you know, that's not happening. So um, we, we need more of that. All right. Uh, I would be interested in knowing if the skill gap is due to the lack of tech skills or a lack of security skills slash understanding. Happy to answer it myself in that it's both. Uh, it's usually one or the other. So it depends on the position, but it mostly comes down to experience. Uh, we don't, you know, cyber again is a pretty new industry for corporate America as it pertains to having more than one person in a department, you know, so we don't have uh, necessarily the, the, the right skills uh, in some places that are technical and others it's just lack of security um, is what I see. Okay. Um, how open is the cyber field to people who want to shift from different, from a different IT field? into cyber? 
You know what? I'll let one of the panelists take that. Priyanka, you want to take that? You see, you were talking about that people moving over. It's what we see it all the time, right? It's uh, so probably most practitioners didn't start in cyber. Would you agree? Absolutely. And these are evolving fields. So uh, if you're looking at addressing the cybersecurity talent gap, I'm quite sure we'll have to be more creative in terms of uh, opening up doors for people from different IT fields and uh, I think that's the best way to go uh, totally. in order to attract and retain talent. And again, as I emphasized earlier on, it's having the right mindset, the curiosity and the problem solving skills. Those should be the underlying characteristics that you will have to focus on. Yeah, I think IT is a great place to transition from. And I think in 10 years, there won't be a difference necessarily, meaning the departments will be one team, so to speak. <laughs> right. I think the silos are going to break away uh, yeah. Yeah. sooner than later. We, we see that same uh, trend happening in education where uh, cyber is being interwoven in the different uh, coursework, not just specific cyber courses, but uh, for instance, the uh, uh, securing uh, code type courses and those types of things. Totally. So next question is, we have many traditional age and adult students graduating with degrees in cybersecurity but then have trouble entering the field as most entry-level positions require three to five years of experience. Is there more talk about creating internships and training programs for these people wanting to get into field? So what we're seeing is not a lack of interest of entering the field, but huge barriers in getting into the field. Yeah, I know. It breaks my heart every day. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, the Fortune 100, the Fortune 500, they're, they're creating these programs. Uh, but it's still, uh, they're not in place in most of them. The, meaning, if you really have a program, you have a succession plan. And very few organizations have that yet for cyber. So we are very much so struggling in this category. And so we just got to, you know, as a, as a community, we've got to say, you got to train. Stop looking for three to five years. It, 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 it's almost impossible. Another thing, Deidre, I think is, um, you know, there's, there's I think increasingly things that students can do within the university setting to, um, you know, actually prepare themselves and, and to sort of offset the lack of uh, experience. So the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition is a great one. And we, and we look for that when we hire in security. Have you, have you done these red team, blue team competitions within the school environment? And so for anyone who's, who's uh, in a program now, they should definitely look at the, um, the NCCDC, which I just put the link in the, in the public chat. Awesome. Thanks, Chad, for plugging that. Um, so the next question is, as cybersecurity educators, what are three things we should do to improve the chances of our female and minority students to land a job? Oh, goodness. So uh, teach them how to do an interview. You know, I still, I still see people so nervous. Uh, you know, uh, particularly minorities, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, shake, how to shake hands and eye contact and smile and give them confidence that we need more help on how to interview uh, and how to speak to a cyber professional. I'd like to see more of that. I want to publish some uh, videos soon for people uh, to, to help. But it's really that inter in the interview, I see a lot of, and just went through this with a client that was specifically hiring entry level diversity. And I really realized, wow, they really struggled with just, you know, presenting themselves um, without being nervous, you know? Hey, Deidre, this is Priyanka. I would just like to add, uh, as somebody who grew up in a different culture and came to the U.S. as my home for education, self-confidence is key. And one thing I've learned is Toastmasters, which is an organization that helps you uh, develop your leadership and communication skills, might be a good segue uh, improving where you present your so that's just a tidbit totally i totally agree it gets you you practicing just talking you know and, and and engaging i love that i'm glad you said toastmasters and i'm a distinguished toastmaster as well so thought a quick uh, bite on that yeah and you wouldn't be where you're at today i bet you without that training and me neither. <laughs> i wasn't toastmasters but i got it from you know my first job that's awesome Okay, what else? So the next question is, as cybersecurity educators, what are three things we should, do, we should do to improve the chances of our female and minority students to land a job? 
Yeah, I think it's what we just said. It's that a confidence in, how, in their, uh, their interviewing, whether it's male or female. It's certainly, uh, you know, women have, have less of this training throughout their, ch you know, childhood and, and school years than men seem to get through different things. Uh, next, what was the name of the high school curriculum for cyber and where to access it? So if you can give the name and maybe uh, type the uh, access information if somebody knows it into the uh, chat window, that'd be great. Yep, yeah, sure, we're happy to. We actually have listed that link in the chat. So if you scroll up, you'll see the Cami Cleary on my team posted a link to it a little bit earlier on in the chat. Okay. Earlier, the speaker was talking about free training for government employees. My question was whether training was open for government contractors as well. Yep, great question. The, the free training is open to federal uh, government contractors also. Our cybersecurity programs are the most popular on campus, so we're not seeing a lack of interest. <laughs> what we need more of is helping graduates get into the field. Ugh, my dagger in my heart again. I know, same thing, not surprising. Our cyber, I uh, just read that one. How do you address the issue of boys slash men discouraging girls slash women from getting into the cybersecurity fields? This is Chad. I'd love to jump on that because I think um, one of the things that I harp on quite often and in, in something that I handle when I train CISOs is actually cybersecurity is unfriendly to just about everybody, right? So I think we're still in this sort of dark ages of cybersecurity where we'll use words like weakest link to refer to human beings in your company, you know, and, and they're the weakest link in security, or we'll laugh at people for posting a password in a post-it note, you know, and when a company gets breached, you see all the cybersecurity professionals just jumping on Twitter and, and roasting everybody and talking about how the, the CISO had a, you know, a music degree as an undergrad. And um, so I think that like we need to just in general make, be nicer and be less judgmental, be more understanding of, hey, it's our job to, to make security usable and accessible for people. And let's stop ridiculing people for not, quote unquote, getting it. And I think that that attitude, um, you know, if it's that unfriendly for just the sort of general population, then people who are facing minority status and, you know, a bunch of other headwinds, it's going to be even worse for them. Totally. Totally. I mean, men, the statistics of retention are male statistics too, you know, moving job. I mean, so I always say men aren't being nice to men either. So why don't we start looking at that and, and change our cultures there? Agreed. Okay. Intuitively, we know that a diverse workforce is important, but do we have any research that demonstrates the value? Uh, such as men and women approach problems differently, different styles, etc. Yeah, I don't have them off the top of my head, but Lisa on my team that's on this call has them and she'll post them in here. Absolutely have statistics on that. Great. Are there any programs that you know of where one can stumble into cyber? <laughs> 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 I did mention security awareness. So like for people who have a background in corporate communications, or marketing or, or education, uh, curriculum development, security awareness is a great way. There's like 11,000 security awareness jobs posted on LinkedIn on any given day. So um, that's, I think, a great way to move over into, um, into cyber. And, it, and you'll actually be better at teaching cybersecurity than someone like me. I'm an expert. And there's this concept called the curse of knowledge, which is I know so much about this stuff that it's actually really difficult for me to break it down for people. So if you're coming at it from a different field and you have a background in communications, marketing, and so on, you'd be great at security awareness. Okay. And the final question, is there anything about the geopolitics that surrounds cyber? <laughs> you mean, is there anything not about geopolitics? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother webinar, Lewis, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking about our safety, our financial safety, our physical safety, and that is always in politics. And so definitely need to have another webinar. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're going to do that. And uh, at the end, we'll tell you when our next webinar is. But thank you again, uh, Deidre, and all of the panelists for your uh, uh, discussion today and the input. And uh, just a few minutes, uh, give you a little bit of information about uh, ISSA and what's coming up with them. 
So ISSA's global interest group footprint includes the financial industry, healthcare, security, education, and awareness, and women in cybersecurity special interest groups. You're invited to join as many special interest groups as applicable to your background and interests. To entice the ISSA special interest group members to join ISSA International as full members, a full-scale membership drive is being conducted, granting 20% discounts on ISSA International general memberships to existing special interest group members for their first year. Join ISSA now and use the discount code of 20 WISS Special Interest Group 16, which is applied at checkout time. And you can see the discount codes on the screen. Uh, just to note, this program cannot be used for student memberships. You're welcome to join now and take your career to the next level. ISSA Cybersecurity Lifestyle Program Elements offer plenty of ways for its members to earn uh, continuing education credits and engage with the broader cybersecurity community. You're invited to learn more about all of the offerings at ISSA.org. The ISSA special, Global Special Interest Groups can be an excellent resource. Reach out to ISSA Special Interest Groups at specialinterestgroups at ISSA.org for more information. Save the date for the ISSA 2018 webinars and local chapter events. Details for these events can be found on the ISSA.org website in the events calendar or reach out to ISSA at specialinterestgroups at ISSA.org. Everyone is invited to join the upcoming Security Education Awareness and Women in Security Special Interest Group webinars and in person Denver Women in Security Special Interest Group events as schedules allow. And you can see those upcoming events on your monitor. Our upcoming partner special interest group, Group NIFICANT, that's a word that I don't say every, every day. Our special interest group NIFICANT events are noted as listed. Reach out to ISSA at special interest groups at ISSA.org for more information on that. And scholarship opportunities are available in early 2018. Please note the deadline of submission. Uh, spread the work to a uh, spread the word to a deserving colleague of particular interest is the Heinz College Strategic Partners Scholarship, supporting up to 10 ISSA members per year. Please also consider supporting the STEM and cyber youth events. They need you as mentors, sponsors, and to open doors for future educational for future educational career opportunities. Reach out to help them succeed. Also considering consider supporting the, the women in cybersecurity special interest group or other memorial scholarships at ISSA dash foundation.org slash donate. And just going through these slides for you to see, so they'll also be on the video. And ISSA welcomes you to join or sponsor the special interest groups. Um, you can go to issa.org slash general slash register member type and select the non-member special interest group selection, uh, or you can log into the issa.org portal, navigate to the special interest group page and select via the join button. So here's to your continued success in cyber. We would like to thank ISSA for presenting today's uh, webinar. Uh, please continue the conversation on ISSA's Women in Security Special Interest Group social media sites. Thank you for attending today. And this concludes today's webinar. Uh, the slide deck and the recording will be available if you go to uh, the National Cyberwatch Center website at nationalcyberwatch.org. 
and click on webinars from the homepage, you will see the, uh, the links for that. Our next uh, webinar will be on February 22nd at 2 p.m. and it's titled Culture Change That Sticks. And uh, we hope to see everybody there. Thank you again, Deidre and all the panelists. And uh, we thank everybody for joining us today.